Welcome. Today we're very pleased to invite Keith Waylu of uh, Princeton University to deliver the Iago Goldston lecture, Inequalities Unmasked, What P Pandemics Reveal About Race in U.S. Society from Yellow Fever to COVID-19. Before we get to Dr. Waylu's talk, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Academy and the library. Um, the New York Academy of Medicine was founded in 1847. We consider ourselves champions for health equity, tackling the barriers that prevent everyone from living a healthy life. At the Academy, we think that the future of health is indeed equity. The Academy Library has been around since the very beginning of the uh, Academy. It's a fantastic library, uh, deep, rich, over 550,000 volumes, hundreds of thousands of pamphlets and illustrations, over a million items in all. Initially conceived as a contemporary medical library, we've rethought it as a historical medical library sponsoring research in history, anthropology, the arts, and the humanities generally. We are open to the public by appointment and have been so for over 150 years. So connect to us online through digital collections, events, newsletters, and virtual visits. Now, let me talk about Dr. Wei Lu and his presentation tonight. As part of our series um, in the history of medicine, we're very pleased to invite Keith Wei Lu to talk to us about how social inequalities have been revealed through pandemics and epidemics over the course of over 200 years of United States history. From the yellow fever pandemic of 1793 through cholera, influenza, HIV AIDS, and now COVID-19. Our, this, tonight, Dr. Arela will try to lead us through an understanding of the full range of health and social challenges that pandemics past and present unmask to discuss disparities along lines of race, politics, and region. And finally, to examine how knowledge of disparities can become a basis for designing more equitable and more responsive public health and healthcare systems. Keith Waylu is the Henry Putnam University Professor of History and Public Affairs at Princeton University, teaching in the Department of History and the School of Public and International Affairs. He also serves as the president of the American Association for the History of Medicine. He's an award-winning author on such different topics as drugs and drug policy, race, science, and health, genetics and society, and many public writing and, and media commentaries on the history of medicine, pandemics and society, and medical affairs in the United States. Some of his numerous and prize-winning books are Pushing Cool, Big Tobacco, Racial Marketing, and the Untold Story of the Menthol Cigarette, uh, released this year from University of Chicago Press, How Cancer Crossed the Color Line from 2011, Dying in the City of the Blues, Sickle Cell Anemia and the Politics of Race and Health from 2001. In 2021, this year, he received the Dan David Prize for his influential scholarship on race, science and health equity, and he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's also the host and the organizer of a new series of podcasts sponsored by science.org on science and race. Um, before we turn the podium, uh, the figurative podium over to uh, uh, Dr. Waylo, I just want to say that if you want to post questions um, uh, for the end of the talk, please put them in the chat. And um, I'm very happy to see what happens next. So thank you. And uh, Dr. Waylo. Thank you, Paul, for that uh, lovely introduction um, and the gracious invitation to present the, the Iago Galston lecture this year. Like many historians of medicine, you know, I look to the past for lessons, the recent past as well as the distant past. Uh, and in the past 18 months, People in my field, the history of medicine and public health, have seen the, the, the historical developments that we study and know so well collide tragically with the present. The history of epidemics seem in the last 18 months to be not so much distant and historical, or even a prologue, or even a, an echo, but they seem 
vitally present, the experience with cholera, influenza, yellow fever, HIV AIDS, as if they're crashing into the present. We have this strange sense uh, that we've seen this story before. And it's by reflecting on this story that I hope to give, shed some light on the experience that we've been having as a society, as a nation, as a people this last 18 months, but also perhaps to think about the road ahead. Now we're familiar with the current pandemic as told in charts like this, which tell a story. What I wanna suggest of course, is that charts don't really tell a story, but tell multiple stories. So last November, if you were to look at the chart as it was rising steadily to peak in January, um, you saw a story in the New York Times of the US surpassing 11 million cases of infections. <clears throat> and it became clear that the previous seven months had seen black and Latino Americans shouldering an outsized share of both the cases, infections, and also the mortality. By the end of 2020, the story of the pandemic was told uh, as a year of inequality that had become both less visible and even more visible. This is an article written by the uh, journalist Emily, <coughs> excuse me, Emily Badger, who wrote that people who could afford it retreated into smaller, more secure worlds during the pandemic. And that has made it harder to see all the inequality that worsened this year, the unemployment that soared even as the stock market did, the eviction threats that grew as house prices hit new highs. And then that wave of the pandemic subsided in March, followed by a fairly long, what seemed like an end, only to see a new wave of the pandemic hit. And you might say that this story is separate from the first story. It's the story of the arrival of a vaccine, <clears throat> which added new features and also complicated the narrative of this pandemic. Along lines of differential vaccine uptake, questions of race, but also, as this article suggested, questions of class and region. And we know also issues of political party and partisanship driving new realities in infec infection rates and death rates. So what you might say we have here is the story not of one pandemic, but perhaps of two pandemics. Two pandemics, not only because of the arrival of the Delta variant, but because of so many other factors that drive a new upsurge in infection rates, uh, hospitalization, and death. And we're still struggling to understand and certainly to control this new phase in the pandemic, it, which is in some ways, as I want to suggest, very different uh, from the first. So might it be useful to think about not one coronavirus pandemic, but two or more? <clears throat> If we ask what this pandemic has revealed, the answer is so much, perhaps too much for a short talk like this. It, it's more than a year ago that we had introduced ourselves, we become introduced to new theories of disease and new language, the asymptomatic transmission, and this year, you might say the new language of the variant. We've had a robust and unfolding conversation over methods of prevention, like the utility and ethics of masking. Certainly the last 18 months has been a story that's told centrally through the question of the role of government and the, what it takes to build state by state a strong public health system. One might say that the story of health disparities, of infection mortality uh, disparity, infection and mortality disparities is really a story about the sociology of vulnerability and blame falling along lines of identity. And certainly 
if one were to look back on this pandemic, one would say that much of the story could be told through the lens of understanding how information flows and how disinformation flows during this pandemic. The first wave I wanna suggest then expose certain kinds of inequalities. Uh, I mentioned them, the infection rate and the mortality rate early on shouldered disproportionately among black and Latinos. And here the newspapers would drill down to talk about the higher positivity rate in those populations who work in food service, home health care, non-remote work, work deemed essential that put them at higher risk for exposure, hospitalization, and death. Populations who lived in and live in multi-generational households saw a much more brutally efficient spread of disease. And populations in these early stages that resided in densely populated communities where social distancing was difficult. This was the story of inequality during this first wave. You might say the second wave that we've seen since May or June of this year uh, introduces us to new inequalities that have been unmasked and accentuated. As I mentioned, these are geographical disparities, they're political divisions, they're new aspects of blame. So for instance, articles like this point to the uh, emerging fault lines that continue to widen globally. The, those who have access to vaccines, the rich countries, and those who do not. So there's a global story of inequality that's being unmasked as the story shifts to vaccination. And along that way, along, along with that, uh, an increasing story of blame and anger. Um, in, in this instance, uh, the anger of the vaccinated towards the unvaccinated. Now, these are familiar stories. And as I mentioned, for historians of medicine, the striking thing about watching the politics of the pandemic play out these days is the way in which the past collides with the present. These themes of blame, inequality, anger, racial and class inequality, they're familiar themes in the history of pandemics, whether one studies cholera uh, as it comes through the United States in 1832, 1849, 1866, the waves of yellow fever epidemic starting in 1793, again in the 1820s, and then recurringly in the 1850s through the 70, 1870s, the much discussed influenza pandemic uh, from the spring of 1918 through the summer of 1919, and uh, the, which brought a death rate that we only just have begin, were beginning to surpass, depending on how many deaths you count from the influenza pandemic. Um, what I would like to do in the, the rest of the talk is to take you through maybe 17 small points, one point per slide on how I think about the, the lessons learned from the past and the echoes in the present. And unquestionably, one of the echoes of the past is the, the notion that pandemics um, expose poverty, class and social disparities. Writing in the 1720s, Daniel Defoe pointed out, looking back at the plague year in London, that the infection of the plague kept chiefly in the out parishes, which being very populous and full, fuller alas of the poor, the distemper found more to prey upon than in the city. And here you see a different city that's configured differently. That is to say the poor are in outer lying districts and the city, the core of the city, is far less populous and more well-to-do. But the story is the same. Pandemics reveal and accentuate class and poverty differences. Cholera, as with yellow fever in the 19th century, exposed similar gaps in poverty and class uh, in resources, but also provoked as many pandemics do, catalyst, they, they became a catalyst for reform. 
the, pan the epidemic uh, cholera in New York City, for instance, afflicted people inhabiting at that point the most populous and central portions of the city, a very differently configured city than in London in the 1600s. It, it too was a shocking revealer of poverty in burgeoning cities, a driver of new class disparities, but at the same time, a rallying cry for expanded powers in public health to institute quarantine, to command that the streets be cleaned or the ports be closed, and then to bring about public health reform. So pandemics often can expand the reach of government. And this is well documented in Charles Rosenberg's classic book, The Cholera Years, in which Rosenberg writes, um, of the, to, the, to, to Americans, the extent of poverty revealed by the epidemic was genuinely disturbing. And he points to a Cincinnati editor who observed that if the disease was caused by poor food, poor lodging, filth, and intemperance, the number of victims gives us a melancholy idea of the present state of society. It was a judgment on society as much as those who fell, 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 fell ill to the pandemic. And it's this, after really three waves of cholera, that led New York City, followed by other cities, to create a permanent Metropolitan Board of Health. This is a well-known story in the history of public health, in the history of pandemics. I'm not, if you know the history of medicine, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. And we also know that following um, the robust expansion of public health, debates ensued about the power of government to mandate things like vaccination, which royal society through the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, and comes to a head with the famous Jacobson v. Massachusetts case, which recognizes the state of Massachusetts' right to mandate smallpox uh, vaccination. It's a landmark case that is still referred to today uh, it, it's a recurring uh, theme, actually, in our conversation about what the extent of the powers of public health ought to be. Throughout the 19th century and through the 20th century, the question of race and the pandemics is a recurring question that is shrouded in accusation and blame. And I, it's, it's really beyond the scope of my talk to restate all of those themes. I'll just point you to some really uh, compelling and insightful work along these lines. A rich literature highlighting familiar themes of blame, the specious ass assertions about racial difference, racial biology that explained uh, some argued differential experiences with yellow fever. I'll point you to Rana Hogarth's book, Medicalizing Blackness. Um, Differ, uh, explanations of differential impact that uh, vi were visited upon or used to explain differential death among Native Americans. So here I'll point you to the book Rationalizing Epidemics by David Jones. The titles of, the, of these books really say a great deal about the depth and insight that the history of medicine and scholars in the field have brought to understanding this fraught interaction between race and pandemics, contagious divides, by Nayan Shah, all of which speak to the vilification of minorities, as well as the shaping of new policies in the wake of epidemic disease, um, the shaping of immigration policy or housing policy, as told uh, by authors like Alan Kraut or Samuel Roberts. Um, turning to the, the divisions explore, exposed and inflamed by pandemics can be of a global variety. And let me spend a little time talking about these divisions as they were manifest during the influenza pandemic, which coincided with a world war, which gave meaning therefore to the notion of invisible enemies. That is to say the discourse of war and the need to mobilize the population uh, for a military fight 
unquestionably shaped the notion of fighting and waging a war on the domestic front as well. And so you have here the international divisions, allies continue to sweep the enemy, juxtaposed against the governor, this is in Michigan, uh, issuing a proclamation to close the state because of the influenza spread. Comments on the Germans on the one hand and comments on theater and churches and lodges being ordered to close up at once. Um, the intersection of these two really defines the, the public health and the pandemic experience in, in, uh, the, in influenza times. Then as now, as many historians have documented, mask debates were also inflamed in, 18, in 1918 and 1919, although not to the same extent as they are today. And here we see calls to wear masks as a feature of personal responsibility, alongside to us now familiar public warnings about dro uh, avoiding droplets sprayed from the nose and throat, covering one's mouth when coughing and sneezing, avoiding crowds, walking to work, and also learning how to make and wear an influenza mask. Then as now, uh, the public media was awash with conversation about unproven drugs filling the uncertain market space, not marketplace and specious theories of all kinds flourished in the space of the pandemic. This is not new to our time. Specious theories uh, such as um, gargles and germicides and inhalers, atomizers available in Spokane, Washington, or this cartoon, which I find fascinating, the cloud of influenza looming over the horizon while the population of mostly men flock to ye old and good germ destroyer pharmacy, uh, seeking distilled and bottled uh, produce for ye kindly gentlemen. Or articles that are hawking new preventives for influenza being discovered by a college professor in Georgia, Wilson's solution placed on the market and is now on sale by leading druggists in Denver. So long before ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine, uh, these are the familiar features of the epidemic landscape. Now, among the theories, uh, specious theories reflecting confusion across the map were a confusion of racial theories, racial speculation about infection rates, death rates. So for example, in Atlanta, in 1919, an article like this, the flu ravaging an area of Atlanta, the Negroes have not escaped the flu, a number of them having here having died within the past few days, and a majority of Negro families have cases of the flu or pneumonia. Juxtaposed against this story from Louisville, Kentucky, which argues that the Negro race has seemed to be characteristically less susceptible to the disease during this epidemic. And juxtaposed against this article from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, which highlights and stresses something that we might focus on today, which is home health care or domestic labor. Influenza was worse among house workers and the key quote from the article suggests that the proportion of deaths among whites and Negroes seems to be about the same, apparently refuting the theory that Negroes are immune. Still today, we have evidence of this ongoing fetish, this debate between biological difference and social difference as the primary explanation uh, of explaining the primary factor explaining differences in mortality, differences in infection rates, and differences in hospitalization. This is an ongoing dialogue. The politics of masks then and now provoked protests. In San Francisco, 
Opponents of the mask mandates denounced the city's ordinance. The audience showed up in the Dreamland rink in one night in January 1919 to protest uh, at a protest meeting against the compulsory wearing of influenza masks and declared its intention of appearing en masse before the Board of Supervisors the next day to demand that the ordinance be repealed immediately. Then as now, masks defined also an ideological divide. Here in Colorado, familiar strains of police enforcing the flu mask, uh, familiar evidence of distrust of government and expanding public health power. Familiar strains also of denialism. As you see in this article from Seattle, protest voiced to the gauze mask rule, some Pacific Coast cities become restive under orders of health department relative to, quote, so-called epidemic. Then is now questions about the reality of the pandemic. Now, when I say the past collides with the present, this particular juxtaposition comes to mind in Denver, Colorado. 1918, policing, enforcing the mask mandate, theater men protesting the ban on theater going. And this iconic image from last year in Denver, Colorado, an anti-mask protester facing off against a masked healthcare worker on the streets of Denver. The difference, of course, is that today there are new unpoliced pathways of information and misinformation, giving rise to clusters, strains, and streams of both information uh, and claims of information about every aspect of the pandemic, vaccines, transmission, morality, mortality rates, and most notably, masking. And so just as soon as these myths of masking uh, of come into being, you have elite, elite organizations like the Mayo Clinic that feel compelled to debunk those myths, an ever, a never ending, it seems, battle to correct public opinion. In this post from July of last year, it was trying to quash a very specific myth about masks that was seeing a, resurgent, a surge at this time. The myth, wearing a mask will increase the amount of carbon dioxide I breathe and will make me sick. The Mayo Clinic says there is no risk of hypoxia, which is lower oxygen levels in healthy adults. Carbon dioxide will freely diffuse through your mask as you breathe. And yet these kinds of myths circulate along different pathways than they did 100 years ago. What I want to suggest is that then as now, there are fundamental beliefs about identity shaping much of this pandemic politics. If one looks closely enough and the reveal uh, in images like this, uh, in the midst of those anti-mask protests from July of last year, this man wearing a sign that says, your fear of COVID does not trump, and I'm sure he's using that word advisedly, my right to not breathe my own CO2. As the Mayo Clinic and others would say, there is no evidence to support this fear, but here are people who are concerned and who are voicing this anxiety about the fact that their breathing should matter. And what I wanna highlight is the way in which this claim about a mask leading to the asphyxiation of an individual is the reappropriation of a discussion and a protest that was then unfolding in public in 2020. And fundamentally, the debate at this time is whose breathing matters. And here you see a claim on the left 
of restricted breathing. <clears throat> it's based on a myth. It's a manufactured conceit, but it's a repurposing of another clear and vital concern, I can't breathe. It's repurposed for the, for the, for the single goal of protecting this man uh, and others from what they perceive to be threats against their life and their well-being. <clears throat> and so this is where the subtext of race and belonging and protection comes into the pandemic story. So historians of medicine, having studied race, disease, and pandemics past, are attuned to see the echoes of the past in the present. For example, when the former president sought to brand and racialize the pandemic, fomenting anti-Asian anger for political effect throughout 2020, it was obvious to many historians that these were disturbing and tragic echoes of the past, echoes of the vilification of Asian Americans, particularly uh, stridently so on the West Coast during a period of calls for uh, anti of, of, of immigration restriction. Uh, it resonates also with images like this one captured in a cartoon from 1914 in the Atlanta Journal and Constitution. An image that doesn't comment on the blame, which is what Guy Parsons' political cartoon does, but in this case actually challenge, ch channels the blame. Amidst spiking rates of tuberculosis, it frames the story of race and the epidemic this way by portraying a domestic servant, an African-American woman who is flying along with vermin, the flies, from her home, which flies the flag of contagious disease. And she, along with the vermin, leap over a river of filth and significantly transcend and leap over the sanitary precautions that have been constructed to safeguard and protect the average white home. The sanitary precautions, the wall, is made up of screens and pure water and garbage cans and good sewage and also medical science. Here is an image of blame, fear, and white security that is mobilized in the midst of epidemic fears, significantly highlighting the domestic worker who lives amid filth and contagion as the threat. This is not a comment, this is not a critique of these beliefs, this is a channeling of those beliefs. And here you see an example of how pandemics can be used to both inflame divisions, racialize in graphic fashion, and also become a basis for building walls and fomenting, heightening social divisions. As William Faulkner wrote uh, much later in the 20th century, uh, a quote that I like to repeat from time to time, the past is never dead, it isn't, it's not even past. Now the point here is that, you know, pandemics tell different stories and, and sometimes they have familiar stories of race and difference built into them, and sometimes unexpected stories. And I, as I've highlighted before, the, the, the difference in this pandemic might be highlighted by focusing on the first wave and the second wave. In the first wave of the pandemic last year through early part, the early part of this year, um, the story told was one of dramatic differences in mortality, in Native Americans, particularly focusing, let's say, on the Navajo Nation, the story was one of a death rate that was reaching to four times the national average, accentuated by diabetes and underlying health problems, a housing shortage that made for a, a larger density of households, multi-generational households, 
smaller hospitals and difficulties finding access to healthcare, combined with a, po a population where 30 to 40 percent lacked running water at a time when we were told that we needed to wash our hands frequently to pr protect ourselves against this pandemic. And so there is one story of disparity. And then the rise of the vaccine tells a different story. And it's captured a couple of days ago, actually, in a podcast that I recommend uh, that was aired in the Los Angeles Times, how Native Americans became a vaccine success story. And here the story does not obviate or, underline, or, or, or undermine the first story of a death rate that is four times the national average. But what it does do, it, it adds a new twist by pointing out that Native Americans are 21% more likely to be vaccinated than whites. And I won't go into the details of what the podcast reveals, but it has to do with what the host calls a long memory, a long memory of being having a population decimated by past pandemics like smallpox and a drive to do something to mitigate uh, that history from repeating itself. So finally, uh, I'll move towards the end by saying that one wonders then what story this second wave will tell about US society, about race, about social differences. And what I wanna suggest is that while we might think we know what the story is and what the conclusion might be, it is yet to be told. We have numbers that give us hints as to what that story might be. And as most historians do, we look at the numbers, but we wonder what the story is behind the numbers. The numbers that I'm gonna draw upon were published just yesterday in an article by the Kaiser Family Foundation, which examines the latest data on COVID-19 vaccinations by race and ethnicity, and also by state. <clears throat> and what I've pulled is just some aspects of those disparities, because in each state, in many ways, we live not just in the United States of America, but the divided states of the United States of America. <laughs> and what this document, what these data say, and I've just chosen five states, is that African Americans account in Michigan for 13% of the population. And the vaccination rate is lower, but not dramatically lower. What's striking is the lower percentage of cases, but the extraordinarily high percentage of deaths uh, in the state of Michigan that are African-American deaths for a population that's only 13% Black. In Mississippi, we have a very different story playing itself out. The African-American vaccination rate is equivalent to the population rate for all that we've said about vaccination hesitancy. But the percentage of cases is significantly higher than the population suggests, 55%. In my state of New Jersey, you have disparities, but of a slightly smaller character. The African-American percent, uh, percent of the population is 12%. The death rate is higher by 5%. The vaccination rate lower by three. Wisconsin, we see a kind of equivalence across the board. And there in Florida, we see a strikingly low. This is where we see a lower rate of African-American vaccination trends. So what we should begin to ask is not only why these disparities, case disparities, death disparities, vaccination disparities, but not the same disparities across all states. And we should also begin to ask the question, how will this story end? And just for the sake of reference, I wanted to point out that the Kaiser data also allows you to look at the, his, the Latino rate and also the white non-Hispanic rate. And here you see some striking disparities as well, um, disparate disparities. 
for instance, in the state of New Jersey, well, in all cases, almost all cases, you have a white population that's vaccinated roughly at the same rate as its population, except in New Jersey, where you have uh, white non-Hispanics accounting for 51% of the vaccinations, but 54% of the population. And then in Florida, you have this one particular disparity that's worth focusing on, um, that Flor white Floridians, 53% of the population, 37% of the cases, 57% of the deaths, and 54% of the vaccination. So multiple stories. Let me just conclude then by you know, revisiting my question. What do pandemics reveal about race and American society from yellow fever to COVID-19? And the answer is a lot. <laughs> and that in order to see these revelations, we need to look not just at the numbers and at the peaking rates, but in fact, look behind the numbers and to see each of these peaks is telling very different stories. We need to see diverse social dynamics that shape and accentuate inequalities and the diverse stories of difference that are hidden often behind those differences. We need to understand also that these numbers reveal not one pandemic, but many. And regardless of where we are, there is a discussion unfolding across the United States and each state about the role of an expanded reach of government in safeguarding the public health. The final point I'd like to make is that the COVID-19 will, the, the one thing I'd say, you know, historians aren't futurists, but we do sometimes look back at the past and try to understand what may come to pass in months and years ahead. And I think it's a safe projection to say that much of what has been revealed by COVID, the debates, the angry partisan divisions, the inequalities will endure, but they will also evolve. And they will define a new American politics. My one concern is that COVID will have a long tail and that it will be a tail that's very much, that could be a tail that's very much like the HIV AIDS tail. That is to say that over the course of the decades since HIV AIDS first emerged in pandemic form, it has become treatable, it has become manageable, but it has been transformed racially and demographically into a disease that afflicts disproportionately African-Americans uh, and Latinos. And so one concern is that whatever public health interventions we embrace and whatever, whatever path each state follows not replicate that specific story. That would be a, not just a short-term tragedy, but a long-term one. And so finally, I'd like to say um, that, you know, sometimes historical wisdom can be boiled down to some very simple truisms like that of William Faulkner. So I'll end with another simple truism that's worth restating. This from Mark Twain. History, he said, doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And our challenge looking ahead is to make sure that the story of the pandemic does, th that we're experiencing now doesn't rhyme with the story of smallpox, the story of yellow fever, the story of influenza, and certainly not the story of HIV AIDS. With that, I will stop sharing my screen, and I look forward to hearing your comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a great talk and very thought-provoking. And the 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 the, the uh, parallels from the past are are, are sobering and amazing. Um, and we have a few questions in the chat. I invite everyone to who wants to to add a few in. But I will start with one of mine, and uh, then and then share the two that are in there. And mine is. You've done a masterful job of looking at the parallels between previous pandemics and the present one. Are you seeing any new narratives emerging? 
something that is actually de novo. I think you kind of call for this at the very end of your talk as well um, as an evolving situation. Um, but I'm wondering if you if you glimpsed anything or perceived anything along the way. Well, I think the the one that I highlighted, which is worth dwelling on, is the the story of uh, Native Americans, okay. and where m many had predicted that the story of disparate impact would also feed into a story, which is a familiar narrative, would feed into a familiar narrative of mistrust uh, and differential uptake of the vaccine or and and that has not come to pass and pass and 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 the podcast is fascinating because it highlights from quotes from uh, Navajo from um, members of the Blackfoot uh, Black, Blackfoot tribe um, and others that you know <laughs> the partisanship that has so inflamed and divided American politics um, has not manifested itself in Native Americans. And uh, one person said, you know, I'm a member, I, I'm, a, I'm a tribal member first, and I'm a, um, and second, I'm a, I'm a party member. <laughs> so whether I'm Republican or Democrat isn't primary. Um, the other thing that I would, so, so it's, it's, it has the capacity to rewrite the story of trust and mistrust, which has been kind of overblown as a story in terms of questions of race and ethnicity and identity. So that's just one among many uh, examples of, of new narratives that are unfolding. Good, thank you. Um, one of the questions we have is about class and how, how to what extent or not um, class is a determinant in, in the uh, in vaccination and in the disparate uh, effect of the pandemic. And I, I guess that I'd like to wrap that into one question I had, which is my, my, my perception is, is that while there's a, a symbolic nod towards the disparities of race now, people will very quickly move on to other factors. It's like, oh, could we know about this? But, but, but now something else is more important. And I was wondering about the kind of the submergence of race um, being disguised or covered over or dealt with in another manner than uh, directly in the second wave of the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, just to take that point first, I do think that um, the, the, the pandemics, uh, more recent manifestations have been so shaped by geography, party affiliation, uh, vaccine uptake, and uh, mask controversies that we lose sight of the fact that even with all of these other disparities, there remains <clears throat> a truth to, this, to what was revealed last year. And that is the disproportionate infection, hospitalization, and mortality for people of color. Mm -hmm. And the danger is that um, you know that becomes seen as old news, or news that doesn't warrant the same kind of attention <clears throat> as these new partisan uh, divisions do. So the the challenge, of course, in, in America is to focus on more than one thing at a time. Right, um, not to kind of follow just the news story, but to keep our eyes on the underlying challenges of what it takes to properly ensure an equitable and fair, um, you know, public health infrastructure. So the other thing I would say, I mean, just to double back to the question of what's new, um, I, I do think that you know, as a historian, we're often asked about partisanship today and to what extent you know America is more partisan than it has been in the past and I would say you know the United States has always been a hyper partisan place um, it was true in the New Deal era it was true across the 19th century party affiliation mattered a lot but I do think that there's something that happened in 2020 that I don't think you can see in other pandemics in the past which is the hyper politicization of every aspect of a pandemic by in an election year, by a person running for president, 
who was focused on ensuring that every aspect of the pandemic was seen as a political issue. And that's, I don't think I can find many examples of that as a thoroughgoing feature of our politics um, historically. I mean, I can see, you can see political resonances of like, you know, civil libertarian arguments surrounding uh, public health in the World War I era, but you didn't see, you know, Woodrow Wilson <laughs> mobilizing the public around um, pandemic. And maybe that, that's not something to do with the role of government today, federal mm -hmm. government today. Um, I'm going to combine two questions. One is um, how relevant would it be to look at the Black Death of the 14th century in terms of lessons for today, or as the speaker says, as the writer says, is this too different? And that, that leads into another question. How difficult is it to find sources uh, on previous pandemics and epidemics that will allow good historical analysis? Um, so the Black Death is a um, is, is is fascinating, um, but in some ways it is a it, it is it is a difficult comparison for one reason, and that is because of the exceptional mortality and the demographic transformation that the plague produced across Europe. Uh, so, you know, arguably, and I, I'm no uh, plague specialist myself, but it is arguably responsible for undermining an, a system of feudalism uh, based on feudalism and serfdom and leading over the course of, you know, decades to follow the, the transformation of an entire economic system um, that led to uh, the phenomenon that we now think of as kind of industrial, you know, capitalism. Or, or capitalism followed by industrial capitalism. So one can say that there are pandemics that create wholesale changes in economies. Uh, the, pan, the plague is certainly in that category. And I would not say, insofar as we're thinking about um, economic wholesale transformation, you could say that the, this pandemic has produced, well, it's produced this, a kind of remote economy. <laughs> right? It's produced, um, it's accentuated something that was already happening, which is a turn towards uh, its remote means of communication and accessing resources. This too has the capacity to produce new disparities mm -hmm. because not everyone has access to these means of communication, communicating safely from one's home, doing one's work safely from home. So in it, this story, is yet to play itself out, but therein you can say there are some parallels between the plague as a economic trans economically transformative event and what we are experiencing today. Um, you asked about data and how hard it is to find data. I guess it depends on what kind of data you're looking for. If you're looking for data of the of the of the character that I just showed you from the Kaiser Family Foundation, uh, the answer is. You'll find, um, for instance, in the flu pandemic, chronicles in the newspapers because every city was concerned about cases and mortality. They won't tell you much about hospitalization uh, and they won't tell you much about these sort of, the data won't tell you much about these ethnic, racial and social or class differentials you have to really infer a great deal from the evidence that's provided. Um, that, that said, it's not that you can't visualize those differences. It's just that we don't have the same texture of data. And I think the last thing I'd say is that we don't have the same categories of identity to measure as we do today. So categories like Latino or categories like, uh, you know, um, Asian and Pacific Islander, um, White was a category, but it, it means different things uh, in different time periods. Good, thank you, thank you. Um, 
one one writer asks, how can we work harder to make sure that the difficulties of the past pandemics don't play themselves out in, its, in, in the current one? And in particular, how can we work to ensure an equitable response to the COVID pandemic? Right. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things that I would say about that, that, that is truly eye-opening and extraordinarily a, a positive sign about equity in our time. It's not the only sign about equity, but it's a really positive one, is the way in which vaccines have become accessible. Mm -hmm. That is to say, every state, at least in principle, right, and, the na and our national government has said, Avail that 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 there should be equity in access. Many states have said that in the rollout to vaccination, that those who are most vulnerable should have the first, you know, the, the first vaccinations. Right. That's a statement about equity. I struggle to think about a historical example where you had a resource brought to bear that was so efficacious where in state after state, the conversation hinged on making every, having everyone have access, tr ha giving the most vulnerable access first, um, and ensuring that cost would not be a, yes. a, a, a hurdle to access. Um, so, so there's a way in which that's a good starting point <laughs> for ensuring. And the key now is to make sure that that becomes a model for other public health interventions. So the one thing I will say is, you know, pandemics, if there's a silver lining, it's that they help to reset our conversation about the role of government. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if you were to tell me a, a two years ago that we would be having a conversation about, about legislation that would f try to ensure fundamental equity along lines of um, access to resources, college education, vaccines, et cetera, I would I'd say you're crazy. Like when's that ever going to happen in the United <laughs> States? So, so I would say the pandemic offers the opportunity to reset the conversation about the role of government in addressing these questions of inequity. Um, and you know we're still in the middle of that story so we're still we're waiting to wait on legislation in washington we don't know how that story will play out yeah we're kind of waiting day by day and hour by hour how that story is going to play out. right so um i think we'll take um two more questions and then we'll be finished for the evening one is what what do you think of the role of social media has been in shaping our view of the uh of the current pandemic. And I want to add my own comment on there. I think that one thing I appreciated about your talk, Keith, is that you actually show some equivalence to social media in popular press and broadsides and things like that. But of course, I think it's more pervasive now than it was in the past. So if you could comment on that, please. Yeah, briefly, I, I would say this is the story, um, this is the story of our era. And it's not specific to the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. That is to say, grappling with how, how social media has become so, so meaningful to people and so easily manipulate, manipulated so that such that pockets of information are allowed to both emerge and thrive and then ripple outward. And it's largely unpoliced, so mm -hmm. it's and and it's unregulated, and it has an enormously both positive and in incredibly negative impact on public discourse, information, deceit, and misinformation. And the last thing I'll say is, it's vulnerable to. If this was just an internal U.S. conversation, I would say we had one problem. But but social media is vulnerable to planted ideas from who knows where. And so, yeah, the role of social media 
has unquestionably um, shaped the meaning of this pandemic and, and informed every single aspect of, 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 of the public health and the political challenge from masking to vaccines, to trust in government, to trust in Anthony Fauci. And, and figuring this out, I think will involve a reckoning, not just with pandemic information in social media, but social media. Yes. And yes. I'm not sure that's one of those sort of big public policy questions that I really wish um, we could turn our attention to at some point, because I think when the story of this pandemic is written, I don't think you can write it without understanding the information economy th that we're Good. in. Good. Thank you. Um, last question, and it's a very specific one, but um, it, it invites you to, to think about the fact that uh, white people have getting the vaccine at, uh, at, at rates much higher than uh, either Hispanic or black uh, people. And the, the writer actually asks for what is the reason for this? Um, uh, that, that opens up many, many possible reasons, but if there is one or two singular determinants that you could think about, um, I'd love to hear it. We'd love to hear it, thank you. Oh boy, that's a great, that's a very interesting question. Um, yeah. You know, I think that um, there are, there are issues of of uh, one, one, one could say privilege and uh, and and the belief in privilege. Um, there are, for instance, uh, I remember early on with the vaccination, there were stories of of people from wealthy communities going into you know, Harlem, going into areas yeah. that were, this was a, this is a New York story. And, yeah. and, and you could only, you know, begin to speculate about the motives there. Yeah, because so, the vaccine was, was available there and not available in their own neighborhoods. Exactly. And they had the means to go there. Right. But it's also about, you know, it's the flip side of that gentleman that I showed you who was wearing the sign about masks. It's this hyper anxiety about security right, personal security that also motivates people to jump the queue. Um, we're seeing this now with boosters, right, where you, you see people who, you know, they're not themselves vulnerable. Um, they're vaccinated fully, but they are hyper anxious about their security and well-being. And they... Um, they're conspicuous consumers, and they don't see any reason why they shouldn't, you know, they're kind of like entitled in some ways, but they don't yeah. see any reason why they shouldn't have access to that resource. So, so trying to understand the social psychology behind um, people who are over vaccinated relative to their population or jumping the queue is a challenge and uh, worth taking up. Um, it's beyond the scope of what I can do, but I think it's a great question. Good. Thank you so much. I want to note also that a number of people have shared in the chat both their appreciation for your talk and they think it's just great, which I do too. And the second thing is, is that they've also shared some of their experiences uh, in one family with the great influence of pandemic of 1918, with, which still reverberates in their family and their family's history. And I think that many of the things we're all going through now will continue to become part of our own family's stories, as well as the national story for um, as, as we go forward. So thank you so much. Um, and let's all show our appreciation in the chat for Keith's great talk, so. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everyone. Great questions, lovely discussion.